about where the disciples go out to go to Capernaum and they get trapped in a storm. And it says they were frightened. And Jesus comes out onto the water and he's walking towards them. And he has to tell them, it is I. They were so focused on the storm around them, they couldn't even recognize Jesus. The men that were around Jesus the most couldn't recognize him because they were too focused on their storms. I don't know what kind of storms you guys are in here, but I just wanna encourage you guys to fix your eyes on Jesus. He is there with you, he's guiding you, he's leading you, and he's always been there even if you didn't see him, if you didn't hear him. Open the word, he's speaking to you, he is there. So we're gonna go into this next part of the song where it sings, even if he doesn't, I will praise you. And we're gonna proclaim that in the midst of the seasons of quiet, when we feel like maybe we're not hearing or things may not be going the way that we want them to, we will continue to praise him and we will continue to trust him. Amen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you before you go back to your seat, find three people you don't know, three people, three people you don't know, uh, give them a high five, ask them their name, find your seat. Um, and we're just going to say this, we're going to invite the uh, speakers and their spouses uh, up on the stage in just a few minutes. Uh, but here's what we're going to do, production, if we can have that number on the screen again and uh, keep it up there for this time, that'd be great. Guys, here's what I'm gonna ask. Um, uh, is this true? Uh, I heard that there's a group of like 15 people 
that showed up from Chicago just for today. Where's that? Can you guys stand up? Guys, can we give it up for this group? Come on, Chicago, stand up, stand up. Come on, guys. Let's give it up for them. They showed up for one day to be here with us. We love you guys. Thank you for being here. We're honored you wanted to join us here today. Um, and youth, I just do, I do want to say we, we're about to go into an amazing, amazing session. Right now, last year, we had a Q&A, and this was the favorite part of everyone. Um, and honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm reading through the questions. They're all anonymous, right? We don't know your name. We don't know your number. They get deleted. Um, but here's the thing. The questions I'm reading, some of them are funny. Some of them are silly, but some of them are real, and some of them are raw. And so here's what we're going to do right now. We're gonna throw up two minutes on the clock and the band's just gonna play for two minutes and we're going to give you these last two minutes to text your questions to the number on the screen. Now we're going to get started and we're gonna uh, hang out with our speakers, get to know them and their spouses a little better. But before we do that, do you guys mind if we just pray over this session real quick? So if, if you don't mind, let's just bow our heads, close our eyes and we're gonna pray for what's about to happen. Father God, right now we come before you God, we come before you together as this, as this one body from multiple states and cities and churches and youth groups. But God, in you, we are one body. In you, we are sons and we are daughters. But God, you know that there are so many of us in here who have questions. So many of us in here want to know what's next. How do I deal with this in my past? What do I do going forward? What, is this, what does a relationship with you mean? And God, we just pray that right now, God, you go before us into this session. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Holy Spirit, begin to speak. Holy Spirit, begin to stir up the speakers and their spouse's heart to, to be ready to unleash into us. Fill them with your anointing and with your presence right now and allow them to speak on your behalf. Holy Spirit, we're just, we're just asking, take away any fear, take away any hesitation of asking, of taking this bold courage and asking the personal question, asking the question that they've been, maybe someone's been struggling with for days or months or years. And God, we just ask that through this session, you go before us. And God, we just pray that in this session, we find answers, we find freedom, we find purpose, and we discover who you are. God, we praise you, we worship you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we're going to put two minutes on the clock. We're going to give you two more minutes, and we're going to be back uh, with the speakers. guys uh, two minutes are up it is now time to get into what is probably my favorite session of conference um, but guys so first of all I'm gonna uh, introduce guys can we give it up you've already met them you know them. but first we're gonna invite Pastor Vlad and Pastor Lana his wife can you guys join us guys can we stand up can we just can we just honor them that they came all the way here they're gonna impart their wisdom their answers to us come on Welcome guys, you guys can have a seat. And guys, can we stay standing? And can we invite Pastor Roman and Pastor Sophia up on the stage? You guys, come on, give it up. You guys can do better than that. We're, uh, 
uh, we just want to say we're so honored, honestly, as, as a Connect Church, Connect, we're so honored that both of you and your spouses uh, made a trip all the way here uh, to speak what God's put into your hearts and to us and into the lives of our youth. Um, and you guys can just go ahead and have a seat. Band, thank you so much. Guys, come get up for our band as well. You guys are awesome. But uh, here's, here's what we're going to do. So uh, just to kind of set the tone, I want to tell you that this is going to be very um, informal, and this is not going to be politically correct. This is not going to be straightforward. This is going to be actually, they don't know the questions we're about to ask. We, they're still coming in right now. Um, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to get to know them. You guys want to get to know the speakers a little better? Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask Pastor Vlad, pass on. We're going to ask you first uh, three simple questions, right? Your favorite food, how long you've been married, and an interesting fact about each one of you. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, my favorite food is sushi. And... Uh, <laughs> Woo, for sushi. <laughs> And uh, we have been married for nine years. And uh, if you want to say some interesting fact about me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess I paint. <laughs> I'm not sure how interesting this is, but yeah. So when I was uh, 15, 16, I won a, um, a high school competition in France. And I got first place. And in uh, South Africa, second place, so, wow. yeah, by art. art. <laughs> no, yeah. I've been, uh, I had this dream that I would be a stay-at-home dad, <laughs> and then my wife would be, you know, like, a, the, what's it, uh, who's that, Da Vinci, or who, who's that, the big yeah, famous painter? Yeah. yeah, but then I found out you only become famous in painting when you die. So I was like, ah, it's not gonna happen, yeah. But my favorite food, I really don't have, what, um, McDonald's, is it? Uh, or? Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, Chick-fil-A, yeah, Chick-fil-A, yeah. And so I. Lord's chicken, Come Lord's on, chicken. By the way, we're gonna pause real quick, pause. How many of you got to try the uh, Popeye's chicken sandwich? So guys, we're gonna have a cheer off. I'm just curious, cheer off. If you prefer Popeye's sandwich over Chick-fil-A, let me hear it. If you prefer God's chicken, Chick-fil-A. Yes. Look at that. Come on. All right. We can still be friends. We can still be friends. All right. All right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I absolutely have, I don't have a big uh, thing for food. And so, um, yeah, we've been married for, uh, for nine years. And um, interesting fact about me. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, we, uh, what's, what's the. Oh, uh, I know how to milk a cow. <laughs> I, uh, it was part of my uh, training as a child <laughs> in Ukrainian household in Ukraine is that we had to uh, take care of the, take care of the siblings and uh, animals. <laughs> and I'm not going to comment anything about the differences between the... <laughs> the <male>. <laughs> <laughs> right, and how long have you guys been married? So for n nine years, next year, uh, August 21st, uh, this August uh, 21st was nine years uh, we've been married, yeah. And Lana is actually from, from Church of Truth, and I met her on Facebook. You can use a mouse to find a spouse. 21st century relationships. <laughs> All right, Pastor Roman. Pastor Sophia. Oh, yeah. Gentlemen. So, um, favorite food, right? I have seasons <laughs> of favorite food. I actually also love sushi a lot. But I'm, believe it or not, I love borscht. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's kind of been my favorite. Um, I've had seasons of Mexican food being my favorite as well. But right now, I'm in the borscht season. Um, we've been married for uh, 12 and a half years, and I think having a brother like Lex already makes my life interesting. Um, we had a lot of interesting moments in our life together. I'm a, I have six brothers, 
and two sisters. So it was a very interesting life and all. But a fun fact about me is I love to write. See what I mean? <laughs> um, I care a lot about food. Um, it's 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 like the meaning of life. We're part of it, and it's not just eating. Like I need to eat with the right people. So like I need to find the right people. And, and it needs to be good, and uh, I'm a big foodie. I love to cook food. I love to eat while I cook. Um, you know, like uh, some people, they don't touch their own food. That's not me. I touch it. So if you got it, I probably touched it and cut a little corner off of it before you had it on your plate. Um, one interesting fact that you probably don't know about me is I took ballet when I was 10. <laughs> Guys, I, I think it's time for a demonstration. What do you guys think? Demonstration? <laughs> Come on, Roman. Come on. No, 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 no. Why did you take ballet? Why do you have to go there? <laughs> um, well, I had a best friend. We moved to Spokane, Washington from, from Ukraine in 96. And he had two older sisters, and they went to ballet. So we went with them because her mom would take him, and we saw that there was no guys in this whole ballet class, but a lot of good-looking girls. <laughs> and so me and him had this idea, why don't we join ballet? <laughs> and so we joined ballet at 10 years old. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> I think we got kicked out by the end of the year. Um, favorite food? I, I have a lot. I love steak. And I, I, I love that medium rare, um, and I like uh, Thai food. What about your coffee? Can't live without coffee. Coffee, coffee is a religion for me. I, I think we're gonna drink coffee in heaven too. And uh, I have a saying that that we have in our church or in our team: one quad a day keeps the devil away. And so pretty much it's been a quad shot latte for the last, what, eight, nine years for me. And uh, funny thing is people that join our team, they're like drinking one shot. And we're like, just wait, just wait. And like six, seven months into it, they're quadding it up with us. So. Awesome. Okay, well, guys, we're going we're gonna to go ahead. And questions are keep coming in. Um, I can tell it right away. We're not going to get to all of them, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to group together um, similar questions, especially those, one, those that keep popping up. Um, not going to answer questions like what's Netflix and chill. Uh, you can ask your parents. On, they would love to answer that one. Um, but I think one of the first things um, I want to ask is the obvious question. I think most youth um, are texting in this question, but uh, the best way to word it is, I guess, what are some key uh, suggestions for godly friendships between guys and girls today. I know Pastor Vlad had a whole session on that, but we want to know more. So let's hear it. Key suggestions between guys and girls yeah. being uh, friends. And I, it's, it's interesting. It didn't say a relationship. It said godly friendship mm -hmm. between guys and girls. Um, yeah, well, I, uh, I think that you can't be best friends, guys and girls, without somebody falling for somebody. Yeah. Samson has proven that fact. <laughs> he uh, was discipling a lot of these ladies and um, they didn't work out really well. And so um, we, in, in the youth ministry, when I was, when I became, I became a youth pastor at the age of 16. At the age of, I think, 17 or 18, I met uh, Pastor Elijah Waters, who now leads the campus for Judah Smith in, um, in L.A. And I remember this, con bless you. I remember this conversation <laughs> like yesterday. We're in Applebee's by Winko. Uh, we got this leather coat, <laughs> leather jackets, like with the collar lifted, like, <laughs> like Russian mafia, me and Ilya <laughs> sitting there. I still remember what he ordered and everything. And the first question Elijah Waters asked me is this. He said, um, he said, you're single. I'm like, yeah. 
And um, he's like, who's discipling the girls? I was like, well, I am. And he said, he said, you like one of them. And my face turns red. And I, before even my face turns red, I said, no. And my face is <laughs> turning red. And he's like, why are you turning red? I was like, well, it's, it's cold here. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and that, was, that was my first meeting with Elijah Waters. And, and he, said, he said, you want to avoid drama? He said, avoid discipling girls. He said, until you get married with your with your wife and then he started to teach me about the importance of um he said first of all as a guy you can't disciple them because they they have emotional problems and we usually fix things they don't need fixing they need they need to be understood and we don't have time for that as guys um and the second thing you know he said it avoids guys write this down write this down <laughs> it avoids drama and so right away my aunt took over the um the discipling part and so never really I had the privilege of not doing a lot of discipleship on the on the female species but I really believe that um, I really believe that if you become very very close friends and you are BFF you have to understand yourself you have to understand this is that when you get married how will that friendship be because you can't just simply cut that friendship off and so I think you have to be friends uh, friendly and develop healthy friendships in the group but the moment you start hanging out together doing homework together by yourself you know praying together holding hands on the top of the mountain and declaring over your city laying hands on each other and uh, stuff like that uh, one of you likes somebody you already likes one of you and so that's one of the reasons why Jesus is close friends um, Mary Magdalene wasn't one of them you know it, it was mainly guys and it wasn't Jesus was dissing on women he really honored and loved women it just there is that dynamic of building iron sharpens iron and so um so I would just encourage that if you do have those friends that you don't stir feelings within them that you're unable to meet um and that that you don't communicate things um unintentionally that they begin to get hints for example that oh he's interested in me that's why he's spending time with me because you know there you are doing homework and after that homework the girl is shopping for a wedding dress yeah. you know you were just doing science project and to her this is like he's interested you know because he's really nice to me and so I would just encourage to to be friendly but to really watch the boundaries like I was awkward with girls when I was single and I, I really couldn't relate couldn't talk with them well and so um and it was it was not good but honestly it was healthy when I get married you know my wife she's not upset about that because till this day you know like I'm not necessarily like lovey-dovey uh with them just because that's the way I you know that's why any accusation even oh Vlad did something that was inappropriate you know our whole team will laugh because they know that is not that's that's been my boundary so I always my boundary was this when I was single is to treat a girl not only according to the Bible what it says with all the purity but treated her in such a way that I would treat her if I would be married to someone else because the Bible says a blessed is the man who finds a wife it doesn't say blessed is the man who finds a woman that means that the girl's been acting like a wife before she became a wife so if you're sexting snapchatting or maybe snapchatting all the time DMing all the time messaging all the time with that person would you do that when you would be married most likely not that means that maybe that friendship needs to scale down a little bit so just okay well does anybody else want to add or are you guys going to go next question all right next question a little more um up there on the scale but th this question keeps repeating also in different variations um but i'll read the one that i think is um worded uh i believe i have the holy spirit but I doubt sometimes because I heard you're supposed to feel amazing when you get filled and that didn't happen to me. So I don't know. I never feel a presence anytime I pray in the spirit and I just want confirmation. Well, I think um, there's always that, that thing that we feel, you know, especially like with the Holy Spirit, we often look for that but it's, uh, it's by faith, and I don't always feel it either. Uh, I don't always feel like I'm having the best day, uh, but I'm becoming aware of his presence despite what I feel. And um, I think what helps me is like adoration, you know, where you wake up in the morning, you feel like it's a Monday, and I know Pastor Peter, Mondays is his best day, but <laughs> I'm, I'm growing to that level. And, and, but you begin to 
fix your gaze on him and simply by faith becoming aware that he is here that he is present in my life and I begin to thank him for it you know it's it's Philippians I think uh, chapter 4 where it says whatever is worthy of praise whatever is good whatever is honorable whatever is of good report meditate on these things and I think when we begin to do that because that's actually sort of like our discipline right it's not like I'm doing that because I feel amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it doesn't mean that there is stuff that's not a good report. In fact, we're surrounded by so much negative reports. But it's simply saying, hey, in the midst of all this, you choose to meditate on what is worthy of praise. And so I think it's, it's that mental state of mind where you actually choose to think about the things that are of good report. And it affects... Our attitude. I remember T.D. Jakes once said, your attitude determines your altitude. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a great rhyme. But you know what? The attitude will, will allow you to catch divine moments in your daily life. I'll share a quick story about my traveling experience. You know, from flying a lot, I developed an attitude, especially lawn flights, with a lot of connections because uh, you're always trying to buy the cheapest, pl uh, you know, plane ticket and the cheapest flight. And it's, I learned now that, you know, sometimes it goes around like this before it comes to the place you're going. And I developed this attitude like, oh, I got to, oh, I got to take connections. Oh, seven hours in the plane, my knees are going to hurt. And so I'm walking into this setting with an attitude already before I even have the experience. And I realized my attitude is already setting me up for an experience. And so one day I decided, because I read in Scripture where the Bible says, let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And I realized when your thoughts change, your attitude follows. And so I said, I'm going to change my attitude about flying because I spent a lot of time in the plane. And so I, it started with a mental discipline. Honestly, like I still felt the way I felt, but I decided not to think about that. And I begin to thank God for uh, the opportunities I'm going to have. I begin to set my mind like, hey, I'm going to get to read. I'm going to get to meditate on the Word of God. I'm going to get an opportunity to speak with somebody, to witness to somebody. And you know what started happening? For me personally, I started to have some of my greatest encounters with the Lord in the plane. Mm -hmm. And I started to experience great opportunities where God used me in the plane with people that were surrounding me. And it never happened before. So it's like, did God change? Did the Holy Spirit change? No, my attitude changed. And then my experience followed. Um, uh, great, great explanation. Bible also says that be still and know that the Lord is God. Uh, you don't feel God. You know God. You feel His power. You can't feel his, Him person. You know Him as a person and His power is felt. His presence is known. So never say that I don't feel God. You, first of all, you can't even feel Him. You feel His power. He is a person and He is God and you, you can uh, know Him. But a lot of times it's true that you go for a season where you don't feel anything at all. We shouldn't be discouraged but we should understand that that could be a testing period where the Lord is developing your faith. Because your faith can't be developed if you always feel everything. It can only be developed when your feelings are gone and then you have nothing to rely on because feelings are not there. You have to rely on something stronger than your feelings. And what I love Apostle Paul for and Job is when they were going through seasons, I'm pretty sure they didn't feel anything. And Paul says this, I know whom I have believed. He didn't say I feel who I believed. I know whom I have believed. And so that meant that he couldn't rely on his feelings and a lot of seasons of his life he had to rely on his knowledge. Knowledge and what? What God said, what the Word of God says, what happened at the Calvary, Jesus rose from the dead, He's coming back, the Spirit lives inside of me. That knowledge I have even when my feelings fail me. And Job did exactly the same thing. I'm pretty sure he didn't feel the Lord for a very long time when he was going through the stuff and he said this, I know my Redeemer lives. He didn't say, I feel my Redeemer lives. In fact, he many times he said, I don't feel Him, I don't see Him, I don't know where He's at, I don't know what He's up to, but he still had this thing, I know He's alive. So when your feelings fail you, rely on the knowledge that you have that you acquired from the scriptures. Even Jesus, he got baptized at the river Jordan. The spirit fills him, you know, 
la 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 you know a lot of great experiences the dove the, the confirmation from heaven John is like this is the Lamb of God he will take the sins of the world he'll baptize you with the Spirit and then there goes the silence Jesus goes into the wilderness and you never see Jesus going back to Jordan to relive that experience you see him quoting the scripture why because I always say this when you don't feel the Spirit feed on the scriptures when you don't feel the Spirit, feed on the Scripture because the Spirit is in the Scriptures. Yeah. And once you come out of that season, you will, you will come out with a different level of, of faith, your confidence in the Lord. And my personal tip that I do when I, the moment I don't feel it and I feed myself with the Scripture, is I switch my eyes off of my emotions and I fix my eyes on worship. Because yeah. worship, what it does is it takes your eyes off of yourself and begins to, the moment Jesus begins to be glorified, no matter how you feel, you know we say God is good it doesn't mean you're good <laughs> it just means he's good and you never have to be good to compliment God who's good for example if you're wealthy I don't have to be rich to compliment your wealth yeah, that's good. That's you know when I say God is holy I always felt guilty if I'm not good enough at that moment but God said hey when you're complimenting me on my holiness it's not a reflection of yours it's a reflection of mine and yours will increase you know so when you begin to worship something begins to change to your feelings as well yeah yeah and just that's so good i i also um remember the scripture where it says that we will walk by faith and not by sight yes. and if you think about sight that's the natural reality it's our five senses it's what we see touch feel smell sense but scripture calls us to live by faith and there was a powerful story about this in you know when the 12 spies were spying out the land uh, 10 of the spies they saw the land for what it was and two of the spies saw the land through the eyes of faith mm -hmm. not their senses not sight mm -hmm. and they said this is the land that God has promised us we will take this land we will destroy them and and I think many times God will even allow us not to feel uh, in that season to lead us you know because that's where a hunger is birthed that's where a pursuit is born that's where a cry is born and and so he he leads us with that uh, because if we lived by feelings it would be so easy for the enemy to take us out because that's not stable the only thing that's stable is the Word of God and so I just think it's it's encouraging uh, to know that God revealed that in his scripture that we are called to walk by faith so it's okay if you don't feel you're not called to live by how you feel and in your spirit because you are spirit you don't feel in your spirit you feel in your soul in your spirit you just know you don't have to feel like you got healed to know that you are healed you don't have to feel all those things to be able to receive them you can receive them without feeling them wow good thing we're recording this one um uh, this actually isn't a question, more of a statement. Uh, Pastor Roman needs to be featured on Preachers with Sexy Sneakers. Uh, so just throwing that out there. I like those loafers, man. I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was inspired last night by, <laughs> by your Oh, look at that, that close-up. Yeah, look at those sneakers. Uh, <laughs> technically loafers, I think, but yeah. So, somebody needs to start that channel. Um, but... Um, but there is there is a lot of relationship based questions. We're gonna uh, swing back to relationships, I think, more than once. But um, uh, one question that keeps popping up is: Is there a specific time or specific seasons of life when you know you're ready to court someone or date someone? Um, my uh, answer is very simple: Is there particular seasons in life when you're ready for marriage? So whatever the answer to that is, I personally, I encourage people, if you are not ready for marriage, then dating shouldn't be an option. Dating without purpose, I'm not saying you have to get married, don't get me wrong, because there's this, you know, traditional, uh, some traditions have where it's like, if you're dating, that has to be married in two months. I'm not, I'm not proposing that. That's not realistic, not practical in many cases. But if you are dating and marriage is not on the horizon, it will lead to fornication or heartbreak and so it's kind of like going shopping without money in the mall either you will take something that's not yours or you will leave unsatisfied 
And so I just encourage people, you know, when is your time? Like if a 16 year old comes in, it's like, when am I ready to date? I ask them, you know, when are you ready for marriage? And they're like, well, in about four years. I'm like, why don't you next four years, you know, finish a degree, you know, get a, get a car, pay it off, learn another language, go to mission trip, do something, develop friendships. Oh, but I'm lonely. Get a dog. <laughs> uh, get a gym membership. I'm like, get some friends, start a life group. You know, I'm like, there's a lot of, the loneliness, marriage is not a band-aid for your emotional problem. Marriage is not a rehab. Marriage is a place not to find love, it's to share love. And so, and if you don't have it, you shouldn't go into that to find it because you will quickly attract the exactly the same person who's like you. But if you go in there already, you know, full and not perfect, we'll never be perfect. And so that is my answer usually. You're ready when you are uh, ready for marriage. Now, there are cases where people went through like an abuse or they just broke up, for example. I encourage personally, just my personal recommendation and a lot of other, you know, pastors will tell the same thing, is to wait at least six to 12 months after a relationship before you jump into another one for a few reasons. One, when the music stops playing, the strings are still attached. You don't realize that until about a few months that a lot of times withdrawals begin to come in and the next relationship you go in is really you're trying to escape from your ex, not because you really love the person. And another reason is that you might move on quickly, but the person you broke up with, they will get hurt more but you're dating someone else then you're breaking up with them because you didn't give them a chance to recover and they'll take it so personally like I'm not good enough and everything so you're dating another person next week or next month is actually going to damage them in a way that then there will be consequences for your own life because it's God's daughter or God's son you know and you pretty much wounded them it's one thing but you didn't let them chance to heal up or to recover and so so that could be the case where it's your time to get married but honestly you just walked out of a relationship where you've been there for a year or something and you know you broke up and you feel relieved but the person is not recovered and you quickly found somebody else moved on and got married and you're like well I'm happy I don't care they need to just move on um, you hurt somebody and you really need to take time to allow them to heal up as well um, there is uh, another variation of a few questions um, but essentially I'll read the shortest one of this version is uh, what is the best way to introduce a non-Christian who won't come to church to a relationship with God? <laughs> Connect them to the Connect Church. <laughs> um, I think for me, especially now in this season, I'm not my, when I talk to non-believers, I actually want to build a relationship with them. Like right now, my neighborhood is my field of where I want to influence them. And I'm not talking to them and saying, hey, come to church. You know, I'm building a connection with them. I'm, you know, we're talking about our kids. We're talking about, but at the same time, I'm showing them Christ, not just telling them, okay, you're a sinner, you're drinking, you're doing this, you're doing that. No, I'm letting them into my life the way that they are. And through that, they begin to see, they would, they ask questions or, and I, it gives me an opportunity to share the gospel with them because you open that door. And so through that process, I think a lot of it has to do with just our relationship. And then they will ask you, hey, where do you go? You know, I want to, you know, can I join you? And a lot of times that's what happens. It's they see your lifestyle. And, you know, if your lifestyle shows otherwise, I don't, you know, why would they even want to go where you're going? I had a, a story happen to me at the gym. So uh, prior uh, prayer to that we at church like pray that you know God gives us opportunity to talk to people and so I sincerely prayed in my heart God give me opportunity to meet someone um, not on a church you know ground and uh, invite them to church and you know just impact their lives for Jesus Christ and so there was a girl and uh, she started to talk to me and my girlfriend while we were working out, just a regular chit chat. And she told me that, oh, she just moved into town. She's brand new and she doesn't know anyone. She doesn't have any friends. And I realized at that moment, this is my opportunity. And so I decided to 
go a little bit further, not just right away start to, hey, come to church and this and that. I just, hey, let's work out together sometime. And she was so excited. Yeah, let's do that. I don't know anyone. That, that's exciting. And so next time we met at the gym together, she opened up a little bit more to me. And she's like, I'm like struggling with anxiety, depression, and uh, mess with my boyfriend and ta da 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 and like just it's it was like a chain uh, like a keychain whatever yeah. <laughs> piece by piece I was like you know catching that opportunity and I reached out to her on Instagram and she started to follow Hungry Jan and she started to ask me questions now like Sophia said and I invited her to church and the first Sunday she actually gave her life to Jesus Christ wow. and wow. the What's to doubt to me is when we ask God for opportunities, we will always have them when we have our eyes open to that. And another thing is that I saw that for her, it was a, such a perfect moment because she was broken. And those people that, you know, it's so easy for them to, you know, receive hope and what you have to say. I, I love the scripture that says that, uh, that, the Lord loved us while we were still sinners. And I think um, a lot of times it starts with loving the lost and understanding different environments. Like there's like a plane, you're gonna see this person one time right here. And there's a sense of urgency to where you're not gonna build a relationship with this type of person, but you have a moment that God's given you and the Holy Spirit's prompting you and so I wouldn't say that there is one formula. I think uh, it changes from environment and context you're in. I love uh, one pastor, very successful pastor, a friend of mine. Uh, he said this to me, and it really stuck. He said, I told all my leaders that if you ever see me not being friends with unchristians or unbelievers or people from the world, then fire me from being a pastor in this church. His requirement for all his leaders is that they will all have unchristian friends. And I think it's a mentality sometimes that we as a church, we isolate ourselves from the world, but um, we don't have a relationship. Jesus was a friend to sinners. Mm -hmm. Jesus had dinner with tax collectors. It, you know, irritated the Pharisees, the scribes that were, you know, set apart from community. Jesus went into the community and they criticized Jesus and said, how can he eat with such scum? You know, which, which reveals their attitude, their aggression. And I think, um, so, so there's a place, you know, I even say this, that sometimes the problem is that, you know, that circle of relationship that you're in with people that are not believers, the first time they hear about the gospel is from your mouth, not your life. And that can be a problem. Oh, really? You're a Christian? I had no idea. Um, you know, so it's like your life is not the message um, and that's what hinders us, I think, from preaching the gospel is when our life doesn't match the gospel. Um, so, but I, I think it's, it's a challenge to me. But also, one more experience. I had a, a friend of mine um, who's now a friend. He's part of the Awakening Europe movement. You know, he's a young guy. He came into town. People wanted to introduce us. So we went out for lunch. This is my first time hanging out with him. Young guy. While we were ordering food, okay, to our Thai food where I like to go, he witnessed to three different people, prayed for healing for a lady that was serving us food. She got healed. This is, this is, okay, 20, 30 minutes prior to us sitting down and actually getting our food. Three people that he touched. And I said, bro, I feel like I'm not even a Christian. I, I don't remember the last time I've done that. And it convicted me so much that I realized that there's areas where I stop being open to the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that he would lead me to, to love people and serve people, you know, in settings that I'm in. But I, I'm not open to him. I'm not yielding to him. So I begin to pray. And I said, Holy Spirit, teach me to yield to your prompting. And I started to sense that more, you know, where it's not like, you know, everywhere I go, it's my, you know, I'm like going after people and making everyone a target, but it's almost like a natural thing. I feel a natural flow where it's like I get a word for somebody and I, and I, and I just pray that I would have the boldness and the willingness to go to, to yield to that more and more in my life. I also had 
I had to uh, go through going, growing up in, you know, very conservative, not very, but a conservative home. There came a point in my life where I had to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give me compassion for the lost because I wouldn't, it's, they're all around me, but I didn't have that draw towards them. And there came a moment where I'm like, Lord, I want to preach. You know, I want to share people uh, about you. I want to um, share the gospel with people. But I just never had that draw. And it wasn't there naturally. So I wanted, I literally had to just ask the Holy Spirit and pray, Lord, give me compassion for the lost. And there, you sometimes it's okay, you know, like you just need to come to that because we're not all raised the same way or, you know, but when we encounter the presence of God in a real and tangible way, we naturally want to go and tell other people, you know, when we won a million bucks, we want to go and tell the world, hey, you know, like I won the lottery. And so it's, this is way better. Okay, maybe not. That's a bad example. <laughs> But naturally, when something good happens to you, you want to share with other people. And so there, comes a mo they ca there came a moment where I needed to ask the Holy Spirit to give me compassion for the lost. And so... Um, I think we're going to move into what is probably the most asked question. Um, I think this question came in about 16 times. Um, but... How do I get rid of my addiction, and who do I tell, and how do I go about telling them? Um, well, th th sorry, th so this one says addiction, but uh, the other 15 are talking specifically about lust and porn and things like that, so. Yeah, I just posted on Facebook. It's, I'm just kidding, no. <laughs> <laughs> deactivate the account and hide in mama's basement. Um, well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate because of the access that we have now on our phones and unlimited um, abilities. Uh, it's a very, very dominant um, addiction in many young men's circles. And so I uh, highly encourage people that, um, that one is that you can't do it alone. You do have to find someone that you can trust, preferably not your friends, somebody that you're scared telling this to. Because most likely if you tell your friend, they can be like, oh, don't worry, buddy, I got the same thing. And so that you, you, you don't need, <laughs> not that kind of a person. You need somebody that your heart beats three times faster. You want to cancel the meeting, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's a maybe a try with your dad. <laughs> it will be delivered right away. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, or if you're married, tell your wife. And uh, yeah, you completely, next five minutes, you will never struggle with that for a long time. And so, um, but you, you have to, for me, it was my uncle, my pastor. And I remember when I confessed to him at the age of 13, I think, or 14. Um, I mean, I, I, I died a million deaths by the time I got to his house. And I always came at the wrong time. I came like at 11 p.m. He's already in his pajamas. And he's like, w w what is it? And I'm like shaking. He's like, you're okay. He's like, you have a fever or something. And I'm like literally sweating. And I was like, I, I have a pastor. And, uh, but then, you know, I let him out, let it out. And then he, you know, would pray for me. So I, I would start with, honestly, you finding somebody that you, you tell. Because sin grows in the dark. You have to understand that. Uh, it loses its grip when it goes into the light. When you, when you come out from that hiding, uh, something begins to happen. There's a sense of cleansing that happens to you. You don't need to do it so God forgives you. Please understand. God forgives you when you, when you ask for forgiveness. God says confess your sins to one another so you'll be healed, not so you'll be forgiven. And so there's a grip that's get, that gets broken. Um, and that, that's one part. But I would just be careful not to do it, um, first of all, not in a public setting and not on social media. And to somebody that you trust and somebody who can keep it confidential, not somebody who will use it in a sermon illustration next Sunday. Um, and so uh, and a second thing that I would highly encourage is, is you have to create discipline. Uh, Jesus said if you struggle with lust or if a hand causes you to sin, he did not say to go and get delivered. He said go and uh, cut your hand off. Now, of course, he didn't mean fit, literally because if that would have happened, disciples would have been all oh, without hands and feet. <laughs> Peter's tongue would have been cut off the next day. And so it, they did apply that verse, but nobody had their 
parts cut off and so that means that Jesus wasn't speaking about physically he was talking about removing things that trigger listen to this trigger that are good things like the hands hands are good hands are not evil but in your situation the hand becomes a trigger point and so you remove the good and the bad this is the problem when you discipline the hand instead of remove the hand where people say things like I'm going to just check Instagram less if the Instagram is the trigger point you can't say I'm gonna check it less you have to remove it and the idea that how can you live without Instagram in 21st century very simple you will be free that's that's what you have to see and Jesus says you you're gonna live without one hand it will be difficult but you will be free and so and you have to because I get these guys all the time they come like hey pray for me why I want to get the demon out, out of porn out of my life and I said which hand are we cutting today I said no place your hand on me I said that's not what the Jesus said Jesus says you have to remove something and so I'm like what is the trigger point I'm, so in other words what is the thing that's being used that you look at porn at and so if they for example say you know the phone what on your phone that triggers that particular app or particular thing I said why don't you remove that for next 90 days completely from your phone and don't log in well I need it for my school uh, no you don't need YouTube for your school okay you, you're gonna be just fine but I need it for my spiritual development you can get podcasts through that there's a lot of other ways but until you're willing to endure discipline listen to this to the point of pain equivalent to cutting off your hand don't ask God for freedom because you don't mean it and the third so the first one is accountability the second one is discipline to the point of pain and the, the third one is is deliverance sometimes you apply the the discipline and honestly you still feel like there's a spiritual force behind that and you might need somebody to agree with you to to break away chains a deliverance typically would happen by you closing the doors of when it was first time you were exposed to pornography by repenting of that moment and if you see that there is a there is this thing that's going on in your family like maybe through your father through your grandfather where people lived in a very moral life they divorced all the time there was infidelity and everything you might need to just kind of renounce a generational influence that that has on that and then after renouncing you just have to command the enemy to leave and to break its grip I'm not saying you have a devil inside of you but something is connected and through that prayer by it could be a small group leader it could be your pastor it doesn't have to be some exorcist okay it could be a brother or sister who walks in Christ and they can remove that and pray with that but you still have to apply the discipline no amount of deliverance makes discipline unnecessary and uh, the fourth thing is you have to sometimes you will not do all of these three things but if you force the truth of God the purity of God the, the word of God in it could force other things out the Bible says the perfect love casts out fear the word casts out there is the same word that's used when Jesus cast out demons so think about this perfect love the other word translation says mature or perfected love meaning love that has grown in you so perfect scripture perfect devotional life meaning when you begin to mature in God it begins to cast things out there's a lot of freedom you get by coming to Jesus a lot more you get by growing in Jesus there's stuff you will get by somebody praying for you there's other stuff you get by developing your own prayer life it will flush things out Deal Moody asked his students he said how do you take the air out of the cup and, you know different people gave different ideas you can vacuum it you can blow it out and, and all this stuff and none of those answers are sufficient he says the only way to get the air out of the cup is to fill it with water sometimes the best way to flush certain addictions is not to focus on freedom but to get yourself filled with God of course there's a temptation how can I focus on reading more and spending time with God if I keep falling into that it's very simple you ask God for forgiveness God understands you're struggling this is not willful indulging you fall for it you ask God for forgiveness you renounce the guilt leave it at the cross and you focus on Jesus and then uh, you walk in freedom so that's just my personal that's good so good um I had my pastor give me an advice that really stuck with me. It was the example of Ishmael and Isaac, the son of the flesh and the son of the spirit. And the fact that both of them were growing up together up until a time that Isaac matured. 
to a place where there became a conflict with Ishmael. So uh, it's, it's kind of like that in our life where we have our flesh and we have our spirit, man. And, and, and a lot of times we focus so much on the things that are wrong that we starve growing in Isaac. And uh, I think it's so important that we grow in Isaac because when we reach maturity, it will conflict with Ishmael and there will come a time where Ishmael will be kicked out. Yeah. They no longer were able to dwell together. So uh, I, think, um, I think it was you who said this to me a while back. Uh, your pastor asked you this question. He said, how long did it take you to, you know, look at porn? And it was a couple minutes. And then you said, and, and how long did you struggle with condemnation? And what was the goal of the enemy? It's condemning you for that failure. So you were stuck in condemnation for 30 days when the, the actual act was a couple minutes. And so I think when we begin to focus on growing in the Lord, um, that freedom happens. It's like, it's like scripture says, by your spirit put to death the works of the flesh. So there has to be that that maturity there and also uh 2 timothy 2 22 it's really easy to remember because it's 2 2 22 four twos but it says flee from anything that stimulates youthful lust so this goes to many different addictions because lust is not just sexual um, but we have to understand that it doesn't st sin does not start with sin and that's where we could be deceived that we think that it starts with sin. How do I overcome sin? Uh, no, it starts with a thought. It starts with a desire. Uh, but it says, flee anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living. Yeah. And so the, the key there was not fleeing. Because if you're fleeing without direction, mm -hmm. it's escape. Yeah. Escape is temporary, yeah. right? Sure. So it's, it's fleeing with direction and that's where we overcome and we find freedom it's pursuing him so replacing the fleeing with pursuing him it's a place of direction and and removing the things that stimulate it kind of like what you said because scripture says that don't say when you are being tempted that you're being tempted by God you're being tempted by your own desires and it, it uses this word when these desires grow, they give birth to sin. And when sin stays, it leads or gives birth to death. So all that is a process that starts somewhere called the place of thoughts. And so if we would take our fight one step back, instead of fighting our desires, we begin to wage war in our mind and take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ, we would see more victory in the place of our addictions. Um, uh, so actually, I know I'm just a mediator, but I gotta take a second and say this. Um, so most of you guys uh, don't know this, but actually when I was in youth, I, I grew up uh, under uh, Roman and Pastor Roman, Pastor Vlad. Uh, because in Sacramento, my youth group would always have them every year, conferences and camps. They would come and speak. And Pastor Roman, I don't think you even remember this, but I was, uh, I was 16 years old at a driven camp as a student. And I'll never forget, So, uh, and, and I'm open about this as well, from the ages of 13 uh, through about 18, I struggled with uh, uh, addiction to pornography. And I was a pastor's kid, and, it, and I came from a really religious church, so it was really taboo. You didn't speak about it. You didn't ask for help about it. You just, you just shut your mouth and try to deal with it. So when I was 16, going on 17, I, I was about a month or so from turning 17, Pastor Roman came and he spoke. And there was this illustration. I don't know if you remember it or not. But it, it was so simple. Something clicked where you said these addictions and these things are dealing with their darkness. And the only way to get rid of darkness is to bring them to the light. And for me, like, it just clicked that I've been struggling with this addiction for, you know, literally at that point was four, going on five years. And it's because I've been doing it on my own. And the, you said the enemy wants to entrap you in darkness because darkness is where he rules. Yeah. Like, he's got you in the darkness. Yeah. But when you bring it to the light, the light is where the Holy Spirit reigns. And that's where we have victory. And so, I, uh, yeah, give it up for Pastor Roman. That was, uh, I'll never forget that. I really won't. 
Um, I remember like that week I spoke, I, I came up to my youth pastor, Pastor Serge, and I just opened up because I was, I was actually a youth leader. Um, you know, and I, that's, that's why I was even more ashamed to speak up because I'm supposed to be leading youth and, and I was struggling with this. And uh, Pastor Serge became my accountability partner. And over time, you know, I, I would fall and Pastor Serge would say, well, you know what? There's grace. Ask God for forgiveness. Spend more time in the word, more time in prayer. And I know that as youth, you hear that all the time. Spend more time in the word. Spend more time in prayer. And you're like, come on, what else? There is nothing else. Like, that's it. Like, that's your answer. Spend time in prayer. Spend time. And honestly, here's what I'll say. After that conversation with Pastor Serge, it still took me about a year. I would fall, but he would pick me back up. I would fall. He'd... And eventually it got to the point where I realized, you know what? It's been three months. It's been six months. And I'm not even thinking about it anymore. And I found freedom over time. But it's that struggle and bringing it to the light, not lying to your accountability partner. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Pastor Roman. Um, there, there is another question that keeps coming up in different variations, so I'm just going to reword it in, in this sense. Uh, Pastor Roman, you spoke, uh, in this one it says, Pastor Roman spoke about getting a revelation that starts. Uh, it's, it's not the goal, it's a start, but I've been praying for so long for a revelation. I'm a Christian and I'm saved, but I don't know what God wants me to do. How do I get a revelation? Um, well, the, the right answer or the simple answer is through the Word of God. Um, but I think for me, it wasn't trying to get a revelation. It was having the right goal. Um, you know, because we get used to the presence of God. We get used to the Bible. We get used to church. Things can become mundane. But where... Um, the goal for me became to encounter the person of the word. So in other words, to go through the word into the word, which is Jesus. And I think um, the reason why I say revelation is a beginning is because to me, it's like revelation is access, you know, uh, into this reality where there's an abundance of everything that you can use. So revelation uh, is not the destination, it's a beginning. It's almost like, let's just say you're, you're starving from like hunger and there's no food and you're like, God, I'm so hungry, please feed me. And the Holy Spirit's like, hey, let me take you upstairs because upstairs there's every kind of food you can think of unlimited and you can feast. And so that access only enables your ability to use what is yours? And so, um, go ahead. Um, um, if if the, the, the last portion of this question on a revelation on what to do yeah. with your life. Um, well, I think that sometimes there's a misconception that exists about what God wants us to do with our life. Um, I like to put it like this, is that your calling is discovered but your career is decided. Mm -hmm. God actually wants you to decide your career. He made it very clear in Colossians and other epistles. Paul says, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. So if you would ask Paul, what does God want me to do? He would say, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. As long as it's not illegal. So like um, money laundering, that's probably not gonna be good. Uh, selling drugs, not gonna be good. It's like a lot of other stuff just it's not illegal and as long as it could be done unto the Lord and do it with all of your heart so that's your career now your calling you don't decide your calling you only discover it second difference is that your calling never changes your career always changes economy changed there goes your nursing job you know you found another one and so it's completely fine we just go from one to another uh, calling is for for God, for people, but your career is for finances. It's for fulfillment of your, your gifts and your personality. And so your calling is supernatural. Your career is natural. For your calling, you need God's presence and anointing. For your career, you need education. 
you need connections and so and some people have a chance to have both of them at the same time uh, you know where their calling kind of becomes their career the place of employment but for most of us that is never going to be the case your, your place of career the place of you know where you're going to be working at is going to be a place where you're going to use it as a platform to serve god uh, like esther for example she didn't she didn't have a women's ministry she won a beauty pageant you know daniel the guy was a politician he wasn't you know the prophet susud you know like in church they call him in russian churches you know but he wasn't like that he, he was he was just a politician he was he was in the government other people same thing were in the government and so when it comes to finding your calling let's just say like your career you know people say hey what do i do do i does god want me to be a teacher or he wants me to be a police officer well let me ask you a question what do you want to do do you want to be a police officer or would you like to be a teacher uh, I don't know well you need to figure it out and the second question I would ask you which pays more uh, teacher you know let's say a teacher pays more okay then uh, then why don't you before you go get you know four or five years of degree why don't you go and uh, shadow a teacher for just two days take him to a coffee and say tell me everything bad about this job I call him spy before you buy you know God told Israel even on the promise that he says go spy it go go shadow it just gonna see my sister wanted to be a therapist and I was like why in the world do you want to be a therapist she's like I just want to help people I was like have you noticed most of the therapists are running on the treadmill five miles every day I was like you hear people's problems I'm like that's I'm like some people are wired for that I'm like why don't you do this meet with two counselors meet with one therapist for lunch pay them and ask them about their job how much they paid to get there how long it took them to get the clientele and how they love it and after she met with few people she's like never mind I'm gonna go manage apartments <laughs> she figured out that that's not that's not her thing so like when it comes to career be practical don't go fasting I just want to know if God wants me to be don't be fasting for it look into look into your heart what, what do you what do you like for that and, and don't make it super spiritual about what you want to do when it comes to your career now concerning your calling it's very simple there's a general calling every person has it's three f's follow forsake and fish follow jesus run away from the devil and sin and fish meaning win souls and make disciples that applies to apostles, that applies to prophets, that applies to people who work in churches. Generous, that applies to me. Every single person has that. So why don't we do this? Why don't we start there, follow Jesus, forsake sin and do everything you can to bring new people to church and help people to grow in Jesus. And this is what's going to happen. When you get busy doing that, you will be surprised how your specific calling will become clear and evident and this is how typically it would happen. People in the church will begin to compliment you on particular things you do exceptionally well. And the other way is people in the church will begin to kindly remove you from places you're so passionate about and not effective in. So you put these two things together and you pretty much know your calling. Without prophetic word, prophetic dream, and a visitation or a deep revelation from God. So that's just my... Also about the, the revelation part. Um, if you're a believer and sometimes we're seeking for some revelation of God. And if we're a believer, we, you know, read the word. God speaks to us all the time. Except he's speaking to us here and we're looking over here trying to get something else. Yeah. But we need to... Um, we need to value and treasure what he's telling us here and let this thing that might seem so little to you, but it is so big in the eyes of God, but you need to cultivate this revelation that he's given you and let it grow inside of you so that what you're seeing out there, because you're trying to go reach the, you know, the nations and preach to the world, but God's like, hey, cultivate this. You know, like, I want, you, I want to see if I can trust you in this little so that I can take you there. You know, and a lot of times, especially young people are, you know, trying to go far, going somewhere out there, not knowing that, hey, sometimes it's the little things that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in the quietness when nobody else is around and nobody else can hear, except deep down inside, you hear that still small voice telling you, you know, that, that, 
small revelation to you, but it's huge in the eyes of God. So cultivate the little that he's already speaking to you, and that little will become something great inside of you. And I think that also it's an amazing thought that when you get a, the calling from God and God reveals it to you, buckle up. 30 years, 20 years minimum before you will see that you know in the fruition and that's on purpose where God will develop your character when God came and told David he's going to be a king there was just one little problem uh, the throne wasn't vacant and they were not hiring <laughs> and the guy who was sitting on it he was pretty set <laughs> on not leaving and what I love about David is that he never went to a university trying to get himself to the throne he simply what he did in fact his story is even more crazy because his dad almost like he didn't hear the prophecy he sent him back to the sheep and David never complained and said, hey dad, did you hear I'm anointed? If you really are called, which I believe that you are and you are anointed, it will work with the sheep before it will work with the giants. So what will happen is this, it will work in the kids zone before it will work on crusades. Preach. So if the anointing of God is so strong on you and you believe you're going to conquer nations, try with toddlers no first you have to go back to your sheep meaning the place that right now the church is interested in you and typically God's calling on your life is not going to be recognized by other people and it's not because they're not sensitive it's actually on purpose that Jesse puts him back with the sheep so that something gets cultivated what is it what it gets cultivated David develops a history with God that Saul doesn't have David comes to a battlefield killing a lion and a bear when Saul came to a throne he had zero experience with God where did David get got that experience? His father threw him back with the sheep disregarding a big prophecy about his future. David kills a Goliath and you would think he would get promoted. You would think he would graduate from sheepfold and start managing a fa father's household. The Bible says he goes back to the sheep. But one thing that's amazing if it's a truly calling of God like a magnet it will draw you to the palace before it draws you to the throne. David gets to the palace not as a king, as a musician. Which means David wasn't lazy waiting for the calling to come to him. He was developing other skills and gifts that are not relevant to his calling. Like mowing the lawn, cutting clips, learning how to use a video camera, learning how to balance your book. You know, th things that have nothing to do with your calling. It's not about ruling but he got his first job in the place of his future calling not as a king as a musician because he was a good singer because he was a good player he, he played really good and then he graduated to become an armor bearer then he became a general and then of course he got kicked out and then finally his dream became true when Saul died he got one tribe for seven years and he finally got the fullness of it and so I just really want to encourage and just encourage you that when the moment God reveals to you buckle up serve your way uh, be like water water doesn't need an open door water needs a crack and it will get out some people are so stiff and so deep in their thing that if you don't give them a microphone if you don't give them a platform there's no room for me in this church you're too stiff be liquid be fluid be flexible be, be moldable, be, be a person that is there to serve. An example, and I'm going to finish this. In the New Testament, there was a guy named, is it Stephen or Stephen? The guy they killed. Stephen. So Stephen has this anointing, like you see that he got chosen to take care of the kitchen. So pretty much running a church coffee shop. And uh, he's running a church coffee shop now. Uh, Stephen, he had a pretty good resume. Like you see these other guys mentioned and you see more characteristics mentioned to Stephen. Man of faith, a holy spool of Holy Spirit. Like this guy has supernatural ministry and on the top of that he's extremely eloquent speaker. Because the longest sermon in the book of Acts is not Peter's sermon. His sermon is very short. <laughs> you know, uh, other guys sermons were very short. Stephen's sermon is the longest sermon and it's very eloquent. This guy knows his dates. He knows the history. He knows how to articulate things and but Peter in the apostolic church did not give Stephen a platform. Imagine when you're so eloquent, TED Talks hire you. New York Times, you know, has your books, but the pastor doesn't let you preach. Instead, he gave you a coffee shop to run. What would you do in that shoes? Would you believe for a promotion to speak on the stage? Stephen never did that. What Stephen did, 
he used the anointing of God to run a coffee shop in the apostolic church and didn't limit the title in the church to limit his anointing he just went outside on the streets preached healed the sick went to homeless shelters jails and other things so if your church doesn't give you a platform but they gave you a position that you feel like is hindering your anointing nobody's hindering your anointing what you need to do is this you need to find other venues outside of the local church that serve people and bring people to the local church and don't live with this dream if I do that God will open the door for me to speak in church because the way God opened the door for Stephen is he died never see serving as a stepping stone serving is the platform he died after that a lot of youth pastors you know or a lot of uh, children's pastors people they see oh I'm doing in transition why the Lord is, is taking me higher he might kill you I'm just kidding. he won't yeah so good so good just a, a couple of thoughts on that um, I think a lot of times there is greatness in us like I think it's God's idea to give us big dreams you know and it's like what are you gonna do with it and I realized that it's really smart to hide it in your heart because if you think that uh, people will be so excited for the dream you got from God or the vision you got from God you'll find out soon that, that people are not that excited but you hide it in your heart and you let it develop I think the things that God gives us are like seeds that you can plant in you and they become trees that develop fruit that people benefit from and a lot of times because we're so insecure because we feel like we have to be right here we give away the things that God gives us to wow people you know like a revelation that you need to eat and you and need to allow it to become one with you you just throw away so that people can say oh wow that was a good thought and and I think there's that element but also the spirit of excellence in what we do can become a platform to our influence and I believe that the kingdom of God scripture says is like yeast that affects the whole dough in other words it's meant to influence every layer of society which means there needs to be spirit-filled doctors police officers business people and so on where every layer of society is influenced by the kingdom of God and so if we can do that with excellence it will become a platform for greater influence uh, there's there's another question um, a two-part question actually that keeps coming up one of them is really detailed he's like hey not that I'm thinking about it but is it okay to sell weed um, which was followed by probably 10 is it a sin to smoke weed so take it away <laughs> Maybe somebody in this panel who smoked weed can answer that. <laughs> well, the Bible says to have dominion over the grass. And so, uh, I don't see how having dominion and, and, and smoking it is the same thing. But, um, uh, we as, as as church we we highly discourage <laughs> um getting high <laughs> so, so we highly uh we uh yeah uh, we we discourage that anything that messes with our mind or adds or adds um extra uh chemicals that are not natural and stuff and so so we you know we call it we call it a sin sin missing missing the mark but i think the the deeper question is why do you need weed to um to feel better what are you trying to escape from because you can you can throw away the the weed uh, but what what was the thing that brought you there in the first place and stuff and so and i think you have to because some people you know we can quickly sit here and point fingers and say oh people who smoke weed but there are people who honestly bench on, on TV shows and it's not because they love watching movies it's because they're escaping 
life is so of so much anxiety so much things that they honestly for hours would sit it, and they don't even care what they're watching it's just to escape others you know would play video games for the same reason and so I would look for what, what is the thing that that brings to that level but the Bible says that, that we shouldn't be involved in things that enslave us and so and that's one of the the problem with I I did smoke in my life um I remember when my dad when my dad got uh so shocked when I mentioned it in this in the church first time um I did smoke at the age of 12 I uh I okay and I'm gonna tell you how how that happened I was I was around people who smoked um at first I, I mean I knew it was wrong and so um but you know when you're around people and you become friends with them and you're not as anchored in the Lord as they are as they are in their in their sin you begin to think that it's it's okay for them that's what my problem was I knew it was wrong for me but I started to say it's okay for other people and then you know it came to the point where me and my uh, neighbor so we bought we bought cigarettes and on the way from school we, we wanted to be hidden so nobody can see us we're Christians you know so we want to do that in the secret so we, we we made this deal that we will smoke for a week and see how that that is but then we'll repent on Sunday so that was the that was the deal we made with God and so um and then the honestly I didn't quit because I got convicted sad to admit I quit because I found out that our family will have medical examination in Kiev Ukraine before we went to the United States and I was afraid they'll find a spot in my lungs and my dad will discipline me <laughs> so it was it was that would help me to to snap out I'm embarrassed to admit my walk with the Lord wasn't where that it, where it is today but I honestly think that it's um it's destructive this it, it will affect your health and affect your walk with the Lord most importantly mm -hmm you're allowing whether it's alcohol it's weed or or even uh, an abnormal consumption of media games and other things or, or food uh, you have to understand is that what that does is it replaces the Holy Spirit and no amount of yeah. food video games TV shows or those things that are deadly uh, bad uh, weed or alcohol none of them can be Holy Spirit yeah so good and I, I think um like we we clearly know in scripture that getting drunk is a sin and oh and you're flirting with this fire because you know people say well it's to relax or it's to just to just to for health reasons or whatever but when you develop that consistency and it becomes a, a way to relax what happens when you're facing a really traumatic or huge challenge in your life or a breakup or something really emotional and that's your escape route to relax where's the balance between I'm um, casually drinking and now I'm getting drunk and the idea of like I'm gonna control it well everybody thinks they will not every person that's you know sleeping in a puddle at night and divorced with his wife planned it they didn't plan it yeah. I think only crazy people would dream about something like that it was a result they opened the door they gave room to the enemy and he's always going to take more than you want to give him and and I think having that um it's not wise I I would say the more we pursue Jesus the further away we want to be from those type of things so if somebody's always looking for a way to legalize something like hey how close can I be to this line uh well I think there's a there's a heart issue there because I want the questions, how, how, how can I get closer to him? And, and, and the, the more you do that, the more things you remove from your life that are distractions. And I think there's nothing you can find in any substance like weed, alcohol, or whatever else it might be that you can't find in the Holy Spirit. But even in such a greater measure, peace and joy and even relaxing. Because like, uh, there's other drugs, you know. Right now, there's so many prescription drugs and uh, so much of our nation is addicted to prescription drugs yeah. antidepressants anti-anxiety and so on but that never leads us to freedom yeah. that only gives us a way to balance our sanity in the moment but where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty so I think there's just so much more than that 
And we've seen a lot of people over the years uh, that got set free from anxiety and depression. And, um, you know, they made a decision to wean off all the drugs, all the prescriptions that they were on. And you know what? Today they're living a full life and they're happy and they have peace and they're able to sleep at night. And God wants to do that. I just wanted to quickly add, um, when I was 14 years old, I, um, I became friends with... <laughs> I became friends with this girl, Melissa. And it was my first year of high school. And I remember um, she would like randomly sneak out behind the school building. And, um, and so I'm thinking I'm being friends with her because I want, you know, to tell her about Jesus, invite her to church. And, um, and all of a sudden, my dad, he completely told, like, took me out of school because I became friends with her. And I was so upset. Like, he, he took me out of school and put me into homeschool and, um, and I didn't understand at that time, but he was protecting me because he saw something that I didn't see. You know, I saw this girl who, you know, needed Jesus, and I became closer and closer friends with her. And, you know, all of a sudden we're in the back of the school and, you know, you never think to end up being there. And so after I came out of school, I realized years later she contacted me and she was on heavy drugs after that. And she was, she was in such a low place in her life. And looking back, I could have been there with her because I wasn't strongly rooted like, you know, like a strong rooted Christian. And so sometimes we're so naive to these things, but people that are in our life, you know, like our parents, like our youth leaders, they're there. And I think it's so important to, um, to trust in them because they see things ahead of us. They see things where it could lead us to. So when your parents tell you, hey, I don't, th I don't think it's a good idea for you to be friends with that person, or you know, maybe this is not the right season, um, I feel like this is an important season in our life and, you know, to be able to trust our parents with that because I could have been somewhere where I didn't want to end up. And looking back, I realized that God just protected me from where I could have been. And so just um, a word of advice, I guess. If people from, you know, your parents and your youth leaders, they see something that maybe you don't see, you know, just trust them because they, they care and love you. I think what you're saying is, is uh, boundaries. You know, sometimes uh, we feel like we're being controlled because someone's putting boundaries, but they, uh, they protect us. You know, they can protect us. And for some people, they can be different things, you know. Um, and uh, we, we say it like this to our leaders. We ask you to give up your freedom uh, to, to serve others. Give up your freedom to drink. Maybe, maybe it's not a question of can you or can you not. But would you be willing to lay it down to become more effective, to serve people? Um, and if it's not an addiction, it shouldn't be a problem, you know? So. Uh, I just want to say a quick story. So uh, for some of you, it may come as a shocker. But when I was 17, I was so empty in my life back in Russia. And I wasn't really a follower of Jesus Christ. And so because I was so empty and I struggled with having friends and things like that, I uh, was drawn to bad friends and I started to smoke weed when I was 17 up to 19 years of age. And so that thing re was replacing on a daily basis what God is to me right now. And so when I moved to United States and I met the Holy Spirit and when he filled me with himself, I realized that I no longer need that thing to feel, fulfill that hole in my life. And it literally, it chipped away from me automatically. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And the reason why people, you know, do those things, they smoke and drink, again, it's they're carrying that emptiness inside of them that they're trying to, like, fulfill with something else. And the Holy Spirit is the one that, you know, fulfilled that for me. And he will do it for every single person. Amen. No high like the most high. Amen. Yeah.
Okay. Um, I'll say, uh, if you want to add more to what you just said about this topic, because you did cover alcohol a little bit, but as soon as I asked the weed question, I literally just kind of, I got 17. Okay, that's weed, but what about alcohol, if I'm not getting drunk? Well, it's, it's the same with what Roman mentioned about um, uh, for us as um, a, a leadership team and uh, people who serve in their church, we highly discourage to abstain completely from alcohol. Um, it, the Bible, yes, doesn't say that drinking is sin. It does say in Proverbs, looking at it is bad too, not even drinking. You know, it says don't look at how wine, you know, goes around in your in your glass and so one of the one of the things is because it's addictive Chinese proverb says this first man takes a drink and then the drink takes the man it always happens for those of us who came from a Russian culture where drinking literally destroys people's lives we see people killing people we see people cheat on people we see people become angry uh, destroy their children drink away all their savings like for us I think it has to be a lesson that that's not a then that's not even to, to come even close to something like that. Um, for us as Christian leaders, we must understand if you are in any kind of serving position, people look at you. And I always tell our leaders this, whatever you do in moderation, people who look at you will do in excess. People will always look for an excuse. And so it's better to abstain completely uh, from something like that. Because honestly, uh, drunkenness is, alcohol is the devil's substitute for a spirit-filled life. That's why the Bible says don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit and so and now I don't judge people who get drunk I want to we want to help them we want to bring them freedom there's some people they're honestly addicted they need freedom they need to go through freedom groups or they need to go through a freedom weekend or they they need help in that but if you are justifying that and you drink yourself to to sleep every single night um, and, and and then you call that normal that is not normal you're just simply deceived uh, you're not free and you're deceived. Now for those people who say, hey, is there anything wrong with if I have a you know, glass of wine with my wife for a dinner? I'm not there for you to judge. I know that for myself, we, we made a decision to, uh, to abstain from that and we encourage our team uh, to do that. Hot water with lemon is free actually. And, um, and it does really good to your throat. That's really good to your body. There's, there's so many good drinks uh, that you can take. Um, and stuff and so so I don't see a, a reason to um, for, for me it's not an issue of is it is that going to condemn it I know their churches will tell you that if you drink the glass of wine it'll condemn you to hell as, as long as it's not in communion and so um, but for us that's kind of our stance I know it's a very in our culture it's a very sensitive topic especially in a Christian culture and so we I told our team I said this I want our people to be accused of being drunk in the Holy Spirit I want our services to carry resemblance the apostles did they said these guys are drunk with the Holy Spirit um, apostles were never accused of being drunk with wine you know that has to tell us something and one pastor I'm not going to mention his name uh, he was on the staff in the church and he said they had this you know very loose policy about drinking and they said you know you can drink but just don't get drunk the problem is nobody knows the line because different for different people that line is different and so he said this, he says when that line was presented like that, that you know you can drink but just don't get drunk. You know we believe in drinking but we, just as long as you don't get drunk. He said in a matter of few years, he says the crazy part is the drinking went up, prayer went down. He said it got to that point where he says the staff meetings were drunk parties. People were getting drunk, not just drinking, they were getting wasted. The, the pastoral team, the, the core team, he said the, their staff, their, his students would go and serve in the particular restaurants. He says only alcohol. They would order and they would walk out wasted. And the crazy part, he says in that period of time, this is his testimony to me. He says the prayer meetings that the church had prayer, he says went to absolutely zero. The activity of the Holy Spirit is gone. It, it's not there. He says the services, you know, are very dry and, and, and this is not to say it happens in every situation. But I know that if we, if we don't put the Holy Spirit in the center, we will have to have some other stuff put in the center. And so it's going to have to come in in the form of, you know, alcohol and, and other things. And so I think as Spirit-filled believers, uh, we have to focus on being filled with the Holy Spirit and then all other stuff will begin to chip away. Our goal is not to be sober 
uh, for the sake of just being sober we, we want to be a good example for our families we want to not waste money on that stuff we want to stay away from the addiction and have a good example to the local church and also we want to walk being drunk well full of the holy spirit that's good um i think we do you guys want to keep going is that okay wow that was you guys are sure you want to keep going okay um well here's the thing uh i think we're gonna have time for one more question uh before we uh dismiss our guests and dismiss you guys for our break uh, for saturday but uh and uh, by the way, I, I, I'm literally right now getting notifications. Please answer my question. Please answer my question. Guys, we can't get, like right now, there is literally, even right now, 47 questions that I didn't even read yet. I'm sorry. We're not going to get to all the questions. But one question that did keep popping up, and, I, and I'm going to try to just jumble a bunch of it into one so you guys can give a more broad answer. Um, but there's a lot of questions about I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I don't know how to deal with my emotions. What can I do? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag onto that a little bit. There's also a couple of questions of what do I do if I'm confused about my identity sexually? What's your advice on that? I had a moment in my life when um, after I got married, it felt like because... I used to be a very bubbly, very talkative person. And then all of a sudden, it felt like there was this, the best way I can describe it is like this dark cloud that was following me everywhere I went. And I mean, externally, everything seemed fine. Everything seemed like, you know, everything was good. I had a smile on, I kept, you know, was in the church, I, you know, I, I love the Lord, but. I just felt this emptiness. And at one point, I even felt like it's because, it's because I married Roman. It's because he's not, you know, fulfilling, you know, the, like what I need or my expectations or, you know. And so I kept finding an excuse, you know, maybe if we go on another date, it will, it will go away. Maybe if we go on three vacations a year instead of one, it will be fine. And so I kept trying to find something to fulfill that void. And I think it also is connected with a lot of it. It's, 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 like, a, it's like a puzzle piece, and only God can fill that puzzle piece inside of you. It's a void, and only God can. He's the perfect match for that void. And it doesn't matter how many things you throw into it, you know, antidepressant pills, alcohol, weed, drugs, whatever it is, that void is just going to keep growing and growing. And thank God I didn't, you know, do all of that. But it's, it felt like I was in darkness and within myself. And I got so sick and tired of living like that because, you know, I didn't even know who to talk to because these kind of things, it's like we're in ministry, we're serving people, we're, you know, I'm... I need to make an image of some sort, and I didn't know who to go to. And so um, there came a point where I just, I closed myself in the room, and I said, Lord, I'm not coming out of here until I get set free from this, until this thing comes off of me, until some kind of light comes inside of me. And, um, and literally, I just got down on, my, on the floor, and I just wept and cried out, and I knew you know, and the Lord said, only I can fill that void, you know, and that depression and that anxiety. And, you know, I know a lot of times um, people say, oh, you don't know what I mean. You don't know what I'm going through. You, you don't understand, though. But in all reality, God does. A person doesn't have to understand, but he does. He understands you and he knows and he is the only answer. I know this is a very broad answer, but when you actually go into your prayer closet, when you actually go, because a lot of times it's just words, right? But when you put words into practice, that's where you begin to see the fruit and the results of it. And so I began to just pour pour the word of God inside of me. You know, my prayer time began, began to be so different because I began to actually experience his presence within myself. And then the expectations that I had off of my husband, it wasn't you know, those expectations fell because it wasn't him. 
You know, like I, it wasn't, you know, my neighbor or somebody else because a lot of times in those moments we become victims and we try to blame everybody else for our, for our situation or for the place that we're in, you know, and we try to find an identity within ourselves, trying to know what is my identity. And that's why a lot of times people go into, you know, the side of trying to figure out who am I? What is my gender? You know, like what is my, what, it, who, um, and so they go into all these areas, not looking within themselves that Christ is the answer. And not just broadly the answer, but when you l go into your prayer room and actually get down on your knees and seek the face of God. That was my, that was my redemption when the spirit of God came into that room and he set me free. And when I walked out of there, I literally felt that that cloud, that cloud of darkness, just like it wasn't on me anymore. Joy filled me. And so that was my question. I think the, the two questions, they're, they're very broad. The, the sexual orientation one. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, um, this pretty much doesn't apply. You can kind of live however you want to because you, you pretty much, you make the rules as you go. Um, for us who are followers of Jesus, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we follow the manual uh, of how the Lord designed relationships to be. So we don't have the luxury to decide our gender. We discover a gender. And the way we do that is we go to the bathroom and we discover um, the gender. And so we don't decide that, we discover that. Now, but the problem is, you know, it's, it's funny, haha. Uh, but if you are truly struggling as a believer, what we do then is that we do what people people do who are believers in other areas of their life like with anger or with lust is we have to renew our mind and we have to subject our soul to the truth of God's word our spirit is perfect it's our soul where all these problems happen and so we have to train our soul we have to bring it as a student to the word of God we don't come and twist the scriptures to fit our current situation because if that would be the case let's say you're struggling with killing people and you say well I can't change that's just who I am I enjoy doing it I don't care what it does to other people and the scripture has to change no we we, we submit I, I like to call it we submit our biology to our theology amen now Will it be a process? Yeah, it might require therapy. It might require some, uh, some, because as a follower of Jesus, Jesus is our Lord and His teaching becomes our guide. So when you don't follow Jesus, like somebody who's not a follower of Jesus comes to me and says, is it okay for me to be gay? And if they're not a follower of Jesus, I'm like, yeah, of course, knock yourself out. And, and now I understand that is not the Lord, the way the Lord designed it, but you have to understand this person didn't subscribe to the teachings of Jesus the way I did and so I am not here like I don't judge a fish for swimming I don't judge a bird for flying and I don't judge a unbeliever or a sinner for sinning it's not doesn't come as a shock to me and if they stop sinning it doesn't do anything for their relationship with God they don't get saved because they're straight they get saved because they place their trust in Jesus and so my goal is not to make a gay person straight my goal is to make people who don't know Jesus first meet Jesus and once we meet Jesus the Holy Spirit comes to live in us now we have the power now we have the the word of Jesus and now we're working as a disciple of Jesus we bring our biology we bring our struggles our hurts into the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we work them out step by step layer by layer but until somebody a believer is a believer in Jesus my goal is not to convert make them moral person what is that gonna do I had this guy come to me one time and he said you know like is it wrong for me to smoke weed I said for you no he said what do you mean I said bro let's face it and I knew his family so I had the audacity to say like that I said you know you're going to hell it's, it's obvious your mama knows that I know that God knows that you know that your enemies know that I mean you're going to hell I was like what difference would it make if you went to hell withholding yourself or you went to hell smoking weed. I was like, if I would have been in your shoes, I would smoke anything I could get my hands on. At least when I'm in hell, I would know what I'm there for. He looked at me with these big eyes. He's like, you kidding me, huh? I was like, no, I'm not. That night he got saved. <laughs> now, and so if, if you are struggling with that, like we had a person who got saved, who got delivered from, from lesbianism. But honestly, like the, the struggle, the, the attractions, 
they were not they didn't they didn't leave right away there was work but see the difference was this I'm a new person now my identity is in Christ and it's something I battle where before her conversion her homosexuality was her identity after her conversion homosexuality became the temptation and the struggle and the attraction the identity was Jesus so Jesus didn't remove the struggle he switched the identity and then now through her new identity in Christ she was facing it working with people and through the renewing of the mind the word of God and prayer and counseling deliverance and all of these things were happening so I would just encourage you if you're battling with that and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ please don't be discouraged there is hope for you that is healing for you you're not you're not in this alone and you shouldn't you shouldn't feel like that that struggle or that temptation listen Jesus was tempted to worship Satan uh-huh I'm pretty sure you've never been tempted with that and so sometimes we are tempted with things that make us feel disgusted and and bad being tempted with something being lured into something is not an indication that you're a nasty dirty horrible person it just simply means you have a terrible devil who wants to draw you away from Jesus and destroy your life that's all and then we, we are there to help. The church is there to help. Now the other side is the depression and the anxiety part. The anxiety, depression, it comes from three sources. The first one is the, is the um, demands of service. It's when you serve a lot, you can actually be depressed from that. Jesus felt power leave him. Not because he smoked a joint. Somebody touched him. You can get depleted emotionally. Elijah did that you know when he got after killing the prophets of Baal and doing that ministry he actually became so empty that he was he despaired life the second way is the demise of sin the demise of sin is when you have things in your life that are contrary to God's will and you feel empty Samson is example of that remember when Delilah uh, gave him the world's most expensive haircut he woke up without power he felt empty he felt depleted and sometimes when you're living a compromising life you feel you feel empty and then there's the other one is the demise of Satan it's when honestly it's an attack upon your life demonic attack of the enemy uh, Saul is an example of that distressing spirit the Bible says would come and attack him and so the, the model that I follow for myself anytime I get depleted get empty or honestly anxious uh, the kind of even clouds begin to cave in is uh, I think is Matthew chapter 11 last few verses and Jesus said this come to me all of you who are weary and tired so my, my first step to myself is this is I come to Jesus I know my preacher I come to Jesus and I, and I like what Romans said yesterday you become real and raw you're just gonna tell him the way it is and then you just leave it there but it's interesting that that usually doesn't solve it all if it would Jesus wouldn't include take my yoke and learn and then you'll find rest that means you don't get all the rest by coming to Jesus if you would there will be no more rest to find afterwards that tells me that sometimes you can come to Jesus and you get a certain rest but there's still stuff that kind of sticks around and that's where Jesus said two other things that have been very crucial to me the other one is take my yoke to me word yoke speaks of relationships because the Bible says don't be unequally yoked so it speaks of honestly getting friends getting some mentors maybe counseling getting some relationships in my life that are yoked people that are in a similar situation like maybe pastors opening up to other people having relationships it will really unburden things in my life it's become honestly a cure a lot of people really need more friendships and relationships home group life group you you really need community a snowflake touches your hand it'll melt in seconds it's so fragile it's kind of like you and me put them together they close down schools shut down highways and flip semi trucks same snowflake and same thing with you a lot of depression thrives in isolation anxiety grows in isolation people become isolated right away you need community you need to force yourself to find like-minded people and go do things together and there's a third one and it's very very powerful Jesus says come to me you'll find rest pick up a yoke and then he says learn 
I believe that if you are depressed for example and you find no reason it's also not just always spiritual maybe there's something you don't know either about yourself about your job or the way you're prioritizing your time and for me it's always been like this if I am burned out or feeling really discouraged in ministry the ministry is not the problem always it's not always the devil it's not always oh my I need to pray more sometimes that's not the solution you know I pray yes important devil is the enemy yes but he's always been attacking everybody you know why am I depleted um, maybe I don't have any friends and then the third one is this is I'm I'm looking for books podcasts conferences things I can learn where somebody else been through that what did they learn information or education but typically depressed people they settle for entertainment instead of enlightenment they settle for relief instead of you know things really to change and so that's what I would look learn new things learn maybe you're not managing your time really good learn learn Jesus says those who learn from me they learn new things he says they'll find rest I won't give it to them they'll fall into it they'll stumble it'll come into their life that's good okay guys sorry we're it's two o'clock we've got to end it um pastor Roman, would you mind uh, just if we just bowed our heads you prayed for us before we dismissed you guys is that okay yes yes lord we thank you for this amazing opportunity to talk about you to talk about your wonderful grace in our life lord and thank you for um even this time and and the people that are here the people that are watching we pray god that this will be encouraging that this will be equipping and that this will be practical application that uh, through which people can find uh, freedom and and transformation in their life so lord we pray that you will use this uh, for your glory god we bless every person here that maybe is struggling or walking through things or on a journey uh, and following you lord we thank you that the freedom will be progressive in their life lord and and we speak maturity we speak fullness uh, into every person in this place that every one of us god at the end of our life we could say that we finished what you've called us to do we give you glory and praise amen amen, amen. all right guys can we give it up for our speakers and our spouses uh, guys just real quick before you're dismissed a uh, couple of quick announcements uh, w uh, if you want to go hang out go grab lunch uh, go that's awesome go with friends that's great but just keep in mind we will have the, the church is open we've got games game rooms we have pizza coming at 2 30 so you can stick around here hang out have free food and don't forget doors a uh, service starts at 6 p.m tonight so we'll see you guys at 6 thank you